Now, as a general rule, having a hobby is a good thing. Taking time to do something you enjoy is usually time well spent. And one of the most common pastimes is gardening. Some people have back gardens or front gardens. Some people have allotments. There are even some communal community gardens. William Devin Howell had a piece of land that he called his garden. And in reality, it was just a piece of scrub land near a mall. But he didn't plant shrubs, rose bushes, and otherwise make it a nicer place. He planted something very different in his garden. Dead bodies. William Devon Howell, commonly known as Bill, is one of Connecticut's most prolific and notorious serial killers. And in dumping the bodies so close to a popular commercial location, he was saying a big up yours to people and the authorities. This is Murder of Crows. William Howell was born on February the 11th, 1970. But in terms of constructing the story of Howell and his crimes, this is one of those stories that needs to start at the end, since his last crime was found first, because, well, he shot on his own doorstep and struck too close to home, and crucially left an eyewitness. In total, Howell was convicted for killing seven women, but because he chose victims that were addicts and sex workers, they were among society's lost people, whose transient lifestyles and living hand-to-mouth and day-to-day meant their behaviour was erratic and often random, often going off the grid for days or weeks at a time. So their disappearances would not have raised too many concerns, at least initially. So by way of Starting at the end, then following the chronology of the investigations, means we need to start with the death of 33-year-old Nilsa Arismendi. Nilsa Arismendi was born on January the 29th, 1970, in Long Island, to her parents, Carmen and Angel. By 2003, she had four children, Natasha, Joshua, Giuliani and Joel. Known to her friends as Coco, she lived a transient lifestyle with her boyfriend, uh, a convicted drug dealer called Angel Rodriguez. She was addicted to heroin and had turned to sex work to fund her drug habit. By the end of July 2003, she was living with Rodriguez, who was also her pimp, in a motel in Wethersfield. 
On the 24th of July 2003, the couple had been smoking crack with a man they knew only as Devin, after which they allowed him to stay the night. The next day, the, if not friends, then certainly reasonable acquaintances, parted ways when Devin, or Bill, wanted to pay for sex with Coco. Rodriguez saw Howell drive off with Coco in his battered van at 2.30am, and this was the last time Coco was seen alive. A few days later, Coco's sister reported to police that no one had heard from Coco for around a week, which was out of character for Coco, who, despite her lifestyle, was as devoted a mother as she could be. Suspicion first turned to Angel, but he passed a polygraph test and helped the authorities as much as he could to try and find the man he knew only as Devin. Key to this was his describing the battered van that Howell drove. By April of 2004, Howell had become a strong suspect in Coco's disappearance, and police seized his blue Ford Econoline van in North Carolina. Rather suspiciously, some of the seat cushions appeared to be missing, but forensic analysis of the van found blood traces that had soaked through the carpet. By comparing the samples taken from underneath the carpet to samples taken from Coco's family members, it was found with 99% certainty that it was Coco's blood. Now Howell claimed this was due to Coco and Angel Rodriguez having had a physical fight in the van. But also in the van, police found videotapes of Howell having bizarre sexual activity with women, but Howell had been careful not to show the woman's faces in the recordings. Kinky, but not stupid. Now, even though no body had been found, the weight of the evidence against Howell convinced them to charge him with first-degree manslaughter. He was also charged with witness tampering for threatening another inmate while in prison. Now, as we're all aware, the wheels of justice take their time to turn, but in January 2007, Howell's trial for the manslaughter of Coco Arismendi started, and Howell took an Alford plea based on the wealth of evidence the prosecution had against him. But Howell was far from happy, and when it came to the sentencing hearing, Howell was adamant that the blood in the van was from Coco fighting with her boyfriend. He tried to get the Alford plea dismissed, saying his public defender pressured him into taking the deal. His whinging and whining fell on deaf ears, and he was sentenced to 15 years for the manslaughter. Now, about a week after his conviction, a chance discovery was about to fuck how well good and proper. As you can probably guess, because it nearly always is, a chance discovery was made by a hunter while scouting for possible hunting spots near the strip mall on Hartford Road, New Britain, Connecticut. He found human remains in this wooded area, and in total the remains they found were linked to three women 
all of whom had gone missing in 2003. But it wasn't until Howell's desire to brag about his actions, prompted by a card game with another prison inmate, that these bodies would be linked to him, and the true horror of Howell's actions would start to be revealed. The bodies found in 2007 would be those of Diane Cusack, Joyveline Martinez, known as Joy, and Mary Jane Menard. Diane was a 55-year-old resident of New Britain with substance abuse issues. She was last confirmed as being seen on July the 9th, 2003, during a tenancy dispute with a landlord. Joy Martinez was reported missing on March the 29th, 2004, after she failed to show up at a planned birthday party. But when police traced her movement back from this no-show, they found that she actually seemed to have disappeared in early October of 2003. She was 23 years old and a former rising track star who lived with her mother in East Hartford. Mary Jane Menard was 40 when she disappeared, having made significant progress in turning her life around. She had been an addict, but her progress was such that she had become a substance abuse counsellor by the time she went missing in New Britain in October of 2003. Now it was several years after the findings in 2007 that Howell's own mouth linked him to the remains found behind the strip mall. Howell was playing cards with another inmate he'd befriended and the cards they were using featured pictures of missing women because authorities had started prince printing missing person images on the cards that were sold throughout prisons in hopes that the images would prompt people to come forward with information. Howell said that the first person he killed was a woman he raped in his van. The inmate who described his conversations with Howell to authorities said Howell told him he strangled the woman and hit her in the head with a hammer. Howell said he kept the woman's body wrapped up in his van because it was too cold outside to bury her so the ground was too hard. He also said he cut off the tips of her fingers, dismantled her bottom jaw and disposed of some of the body parts in Virginia. He also said that he slept next to the woman's body in the van, calling her his baby. <sighs> Through the detailed conversations he had with this inmate named Jonathan Mills, himself a convicted quadruple murderer, Mills was able to draw a detailed map of the area that Howell called his garden, with locations of remains buried in the area marked on the map. And this led to further searches of the area where the three bodies had been discovered in 2007, with the result that a further four sets of remains were found in April of 2015. Within, uh, certainly within an acre, I believe, uh, of that area. That's a fair-sized piece of property out there. 
First at five, a major break. A suspected serial killer's decade-old crime spree comes to a head. Police reveal more victims were discovered, but they have their suspect. Good evening. The crimes began a dozen years ago and centered around a wooded area near West Farms Mall in New Britain. It is that area where police have just revealed the remains of at least four additional victims have been discovered. In all, at least seven women are believed to have been killed at the hands of the same man, and tonight he is in police custody. Let's head straight out to Fox Connecticut's John Charlton, who's live at police headquarters with the late-breaking details. John. Well, Katie and Brent, police had thought all along, suspected all along, that there were more bodies behind that strip mall in New Britain. And today, here at the police department, they made that announcement that they uncovered four more victims. Three of them identified, or three of them unidentified, one identified. They also have a suspect, but that suspect has not been identified. The remains recovered were skeletal in nature and consistent with having been at this location for at least 10 years. Three weeks of digging in the Greater New Britain Serial Killer Task Force unearthed even more horror behind a New Britain strip mall off Route 9 near Corbin's Corner. We basically took that area of probably over an acre uh, down in grade uh, by about three feet. Four more sets of bones from four different people, making a total of seven victims. This after years of not finding anything since 2007 when police dug up the remains of Mary J. Menard, Diane Cusack, and Joy Valine Martinez. Monday, another victim identified. Melanie Ruth Camellini. This is a picture of Melanie. Melanie was born May 11th, 1973, and is from Seymour, Connecticut. Melanie Camellini was last seen in Waterbury, Connecticut, in January 2003. Melanie this led to further searches of the area where three bodies had been discovered in 2007 with the result that a further four sets of remains that were found in April of 2015. These remains were ultimately identified as Coco Arismendi, Marilyn Gonzalez, Melanie Camellini and Danny Wistnant. Now it was Coco's story that we started with today. Marilyn Gonzalez was a 26 year old mother of two from Farmington, Connecticut. Not much else is known about her other than the fact that she went missing like those already mentioned in 2003. Melanie Camellini was 29 and despite ongoing substance abuse issues including periods of getting clean and relapsing despite all of that she was close with her family. Originally from Seymour, she was a mother of two living in Waterbury and turned to sex work if she needed drug money. She was last seen in the company of two men in the Waterbury area. Even though she had a tendency to go off the grid for days or weeks at a time, it was known that she went missing on the 1st of January 2003. The case of Danny Wistnant struck me as somewhat ironic. Danny was born on October the 5th 1958 and was a 44 year old transgender woman living under the name of Janice Roberts. She was last seen outside a stop and shop in Weatherfield, getting into Howell's shit heap van, which as an aside he actually called the murder mobile. And this happened on the 18th of June 2003, with her being officially reported missing on the 24th of June 2003. Howell later confessed that he tried to engage Janice in a sex act but strangled her when he found out she was transgender. 
like she was the sick fucker. Right, Bill? So, in total, seven sets of remains were found in Howell's garden. In terms of legal proceedings, there's not really a great deal to say, since Howell's own words essentially convicted him. He was already serving time for the killing of Coco Arismendi, and ultimately he really had no choice in pleading guilty to the murders of the other six women. On November the 17th, 2017, he was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. Thank fuck for that. The word I hate most in crime cases is concurrent. Every crime warrants its own punishment. He was tearful and apologetic, but you can make what you will of that. I think there are cases where perpetrators are genuinely remorseful and reticent, but they are generally crimes of passion where things get out of hand. I find it a lot harder to believe that a serial killer can have the same sort of feelings, other than maybe feeling sorry for themselves. He told the court that he felt he deserved the death penalty, but this had been abolished by the Connecticut Supreme Court in 2015, so it was a relatively safe thing for him to say, really. While Howell is among the lesser known in the pantheon of serial killers. One of the reasons we know quite as much as we do is through the lengthy correspondence between Howell and a journalist called Anne K. Howard. They began corresponding when Howell was in prison for the manslaughter of Coco Arismendi and continued through the discovery of the garden and the following investigations and court proceedings. These calls and letters ultimately became a book by Anne entitled His Garden Conversations with a Serial Killer. I do find it bleakly amusing that one of the quotes in the blurb about the book on Amazon and other places is actually a quote from Howell himself saying, you want to know what happened Ask Anne Howard. It gave me a wry smile anyway. So that was the dark story of William Devon Howell. He may have considered himself a gardener, but Alan Titchmarsh he wasn't and this wasn't ground force. But he knew what he was. And once he started, he couldn't stop, since all the victims were abducted and killed in 2003. He described his own actions as monstrous, cowardly and selfish. And I don't see how any right-thinking person could argue with that assessment. In choosing victims that were less valuable, and I stress I mean that in terms of people who wouldn't be immediately missed, which is why a great many serial killers target addicts and sex workers. 
but through doing all of this he was able to satisfy the grotesque need that has grown inside him but we need to remember the victims Mary Jane Menard Melanie Calamineri Joy Martinez Marilyn Gonzalez Janice Roberts Coco Arismendi and Diane Cusack were valuable and all were and are missed greatly. The video is of course dedicated to these women who had the misfortune to cross the path of Bill Howell in 2003. So what are your thoughts on this case? Let me know down below and why not give me a cheeky subscribe if you haven't yet. Samson would really really like you to. <clears throat> Having said that thank you for watching another episode of Murder of Crows. This is your host Samson and I obviously am his personal assistant Steve. And we will see you when we see you. Say that.